welcome everyone to the panel to discuss about child security with Babylon and Egalayer. I'm so excited to be here with two founders who are at the forefront of child security innovation. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm the CEO uh, of scb 10 x and today I'm with David Say, the CEO and co-founder of Babylon. He's also a professor at Stanford University. In the middle, I have Shuram Kanan. He's the CEO and co-founder of Egalayer. He's also a director uh, at Washington, uh, University of Washington's Blockchain Lab. Welcome, guys. So before we delve into more details about Babylon and Egalayer, could you give us like a quick introduction about yourself and what can kind of inspire you to embark on this journey um, to turn from, you know, professors to crypto founders? Maybe you start with David. Oh, great. So, hey, thanks for inviting us here. It's uh, great to be here. So, yeah, so um, we have a research lab on consensus protocol in uh, Stanford, and we've been doing research in this area for a few years. And uh, so in the process, we get to interact with uh, many partners like um, Ethereum Foundation. We have a lot of collaboration with them. Uh, but then at some point you think, hey, you have a good idea. Why don't we give it a try and uh, push it out there and see whether or not we can actually uh, deploy and build something real to be used in the crypto world. So that's how we transition from uh, academic project to a actual project. That's exciting journey. How about you, Sriram? Yeah, thank you so much, Pai. Uh, again, pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been, uh, again, working on blockchains over the last five and a half years, also as a faculty member at the University of Washington, Seattle. And uh, one of the things actually David and I ran into like several years back is when we build new protocols. Every time you build a new protocol, you need to go start your own like new trust network. And it's very difficult and very expensive to get bootstrapped because the more uh, more trust you have in your trust network, the more people use it, the more people use it, the more trust you can build, but it is very difficult to get started. So if there was a way to easily experiment in borrowing trust from a known trust network, that would be really cool. So that's what we, um, that was one of my uh, ambitions. And I think what we are building is basically uh, aligned towards that goal. Yeah, I think that that's interesting concept. Like maybe let's delve into more details about the concept of borrow or shared security. Like um, what exactly is shared security? Why does it matter? And um, what's your project goals and mission in this space? Maybe let's begin with Sri Ram. I think you can continue. Yeah. Uh, shared security is this idea that um, um, there is a common security pool that can now be used across many different applications. That's the highest level, right? Many different modules or applications sharing a common pool of security. And uh, I would say that the story really started with Ethereum in terms of shared security. The idea being you have a common smart contract programming language and uh, now anybody can come and build their own modules and applications on top of this common programming substrate. So that is what I would call as shared security is many different applications or modules or systems relying on a common pool of decentralized trust. There are just many different ways in which one can do it, but all of them, I think, uh, come under this category we call shared security. Mm, got it. David, anything to add on? Yeah, so um, correct. I think Ethereum is uh, the first um, such vision of shared security. Um, I think what is also uh, more interesting is to achieve shared security also uh, across totally independent blockchains. So you have one blockchain like Ethereum or Bitcoin, which is very secured. Mm. Uh, and one of the beautiful things about blockchain is unlike closed companies in Web2, blockchains are public. 
So the fact that a blockchain is public means that anybody can read and write into a blockchain. And the question is, how do you extract security from a blockchain just because it's a permissionless, something you can write and read on and extract the security to inherit it for another blockchain, for example. So that is something that really fascinates us. Uh, and Sherman and I have been doing a lot of research in this area, how to borrow security from one blockchain to another. And I think that's sort of uh, what is so fascinating about the blockchain world. Everything is public. Mm, yeah, I think that's interesting. But you guys, um, to, to borrow from different networks. So Babylon chose to work on um, Bitcoin. Why, you know, she um, or Galea chose to work on Ethereum. Just wonder to hear like what attributes in each network kind of influence your decision to work on one network over the other. We can start with David. Oh, so a year, uh, two years ago, when we started working on this, uh, Sherman and I have been talking a lot, and we thought, you know, let's divide the world into two halves, and uh, Shuram will conquer half, and we'll conquer the other half. So that's kind of our pact. Uh, no, just joking. But, uh, <laughs> I, only slightly joking. Um, so Bitcoin and Ethereum are both certainly very important blockchains. Uh, what we find uh, particularly interesting about Bitcoin is that it has sort of multiple um, properties that makes it very uh, enticing from a security sharing point of view. So just to give you two examples, one is that it is a proof of work blockchain. And as you know, most of the new blockchains that are people are building upon are proof of stake blockchain. And you know, well, the world is, one of the very important things about the world is diversity. So I don't know whether in Thailand, diversity is important, but in the United States, diversity is very important. So here we have a diversity of security model, proof of work and proof of stake. And actually both of them have very interesting complementary security property. For example, proof of work uh, is very, strong in long range security. So you, it's very hard to reorg a Bitcoin chain for like a hundred blocks, it's almost impossible. Whereas in a proof of stake chain, the security in the very short range is very good because it is designed to be, have very fast banality. But in the long range, for example, when you start unbonding stake, then the security becomes problematic. And that's one reason, for example, Ethereum never allowed unbonding of stake until the uh, recent uh, Shanghai upgrade. So, so Bitcoin, long, uh, the strongest proof of work network together with proof of stake network give very interesting complementary advantage. So that's sort of one reason why we were kind of captivated by for using Bitcoin as an anchor for sharing security. Mm, got it, yeah. How about you, Shiram? Yeah, before I talk about Eigenlayer, I just want to add on something to what David said about Bitcoin. Not only that Bitcoin has these interesting and special properties, there are, you know, if you look at the layer two economy, which is in some sense a shared security economy on Ethereum, massive, right? And, you know, Bitcoin lacking some of the dimensions of programmability, basically there is not that big of a layer two economy on top of, you know, Bitcoin. And I see Babylon as basically like trying to kind of create a gadget that takes the Bitcoin security and then supply it to everybody. I think this is uh, a really uh, interesting idea in that relative to the security potential available, uh, how, you know, how much is being utilized, basically, you know, the ratio on Ethereum to Bitcoin's quite different in that, like in Bitcoin, the only thing going on is really transacting Bitcoins. And we see this uh, interesting trend recently with things like ordinals and inscriptions, basically, you know, uh, leveraging some of these things. So I see that's where like Babylon's playing a major role. Um, from our viewpoint, why did uh, we choose to work on Ethereum? Uh, Ethereum's already kind of committed to the shared security landscape. 
and to the principle of permissionless innovation. So if you compare that between Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin has this massive security base, but you know, even many people coming and saying that ordinals is a denial of service attack on Bitcoin. There's no agreement whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. One would think from the outset, hey, people are doing something new, that should be good. But that's not the kind of driving ethos in the Bitcoin space. In the Ethereum space, building new and interesting things is one of the main values, permissionless generation. And you can see this already in the layer two era. The idea that Ethereum said, hey, I'm not going to worry about making my execution layer the best, or I'm not going to try to make a sharded blockchain. I'm going to let layer two rollups basically go and do all these things. And that's the ethos of the Ethereum space, which we found to be like uh, quite aligned. Um, so David mentioned that Bitcoin has this uh, proof of work and Ethereum moved into the proof of stake. Um, and pretty much all other blockchains are proof of stake. So we think, you know, if all other blockchains are proof of stake and the core thing in proof of stake is stake, which is actually like capital, and Ethereum already has like phenomenal amount of capital, like in the staking economy. Why not just leverage it for everything? Like it's not clear why we should have segregated, uh, disaggregated ecosystems rather than, you know, a common ecosystem on which the same stake can be utilized for many, many different things. So that's the core principle of Eigenlayer. And we built this idea called restaking, which is you take the Ethereum stake, you stake in Ethereum. And then you can reuse the same stake across many different services that anybody can build on top of it. Mm. I think it's interesting that you guys like pick the, the strength uh, or strength of the properties of each network and try to expand beyond its net network. Yeah. So now I, I really want to understand how it works. Um, Shri Ram, you to touch uh, a bit on a uh, high level, like, Maybe can you give us like um, more details about like how does it, the chat security process work and what are the key technologies behind um, Eigenlayer and, and Babylon as well? Yeah, totally. Uh, from, from the uh, Eigenlayer viewpoint, I think uh, the, um, the main technology is what we call restaking. The idea is rather simple. Uh, the way staking works is you put on a bunch of capital and then you're saying, I'm going to make Ethereum blocks correctly. And if I don't do it, you can apply a negative incentive and take away my ETH. So this is the core functioning of the Ethereum proof of stake protocol. What we do with Eigenlayer is say that it's Eigenlayer is not a new layer one or anything. It's basically a set of smart contracts on Ethereum. What it lets you do is it lets you make additional commitments with your same ETH that you're using to stake in Ethereum, what kind of commitments can you make? You can say, hey, here is a new data storage protocol, or here's a new chain protocol, or here's a new uh, multi-party computation protocol, anything interesting. Now you could basically say, I'm opting into that. And when you opt into any of these new services, you download that software as a staker. Now, normally you would download the Ethereum software and run it. As a staker, you also download this other software and then run it on your computer. So we have this um, system where you, uh, as a staker, now make commitments to run any other service in addition to Ethereum. And if you misbehave in any of those other services, you may lose a portion of your ETH, which have staked in the Ethereum contracts. So that's the core idea of restaking. And this essentially allows the stake that people have, which, as I mentioned, there's a lot of stake uh, staked on Ethereum. Right now, maybe there's $35 plus billion of stake on Ethereum. And uh, after the merge and recently after the uh, uh, upgrade called Chapella, there's the ability to withdraw stake. And all of these together has lent more confidence into the Ethereum staking economy, and many more people are wanting to stake. So... Eigenlayer essentially allows these stakers to participate in additional validation services and earn additional fees from all these different services. Mm, got it. How about um, David? Like, can you share a bit more in terms of Babylon's um, chat security process and, and key technology? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, Bitcoin um, has multiple facets to Bitcoin. So Babylon, 
basically wants to develop multiple protocols which extract this security from Bitcoin. So what we've built so far is what we call a time stamping protocol. So in Nakamoto's original white paper, he mentioned that he wants to build Bitcoin as a time stamping server. So time, you know, is something that we take for granted. But actually, if you think about a blockchain, the core um, uh, service that's provided by blockchain is to give a strong sense of what time does each event occurs so that you can use this time to order events. And so Bitcoin being the, one of the most secure chain, arguably the most secure chain, this time stamping is a very secure time stamping. So we want to use that as like a universal clock for which every other proof of stake chain, for example, can use as the reference. And so what we build is essentially a very efficient time stamping service that allows any proof of stake chains to timestamp the blocks onto the Bitcoin network so that that gives it a sense of time. Now, why is this time important? There are multiple use cases, but one particular use case that is in, quite interesting is this notion of uh, secure and fast unbonding. So in proof of stake chain, so Shira mentioned that um, in the Chappelle upgrade, Ethereum just recently allowed the unbonding of, of stake. Now, why was the stake not allowed to be unbonded in the first place? And one reason is because actually the unbonding process creates an attack vector, so-called long-range attack vector, where after you unbond, a sticker can come back and attack the chain. And because it is unbonded, the, the, the protection that Shura mentioned about slashing or about taking away the deposit is no longer valid. And so this becomes like a weak point. You know, it's like in Chinese Kung Fu, there's always a weak point, like at the back of the head or something like that, that you cannot protect. And so it's, this is some weakness that proof of section can never protect. So we, we basically show that it's actually impossible to protect this without any external trust. And so basically we're using this timestamp to say that, hey, you actually cannot come back because you're, you have already created a chain with a particular timestamp. Anything you created is actually later according to this universal clock. So this protects this long range attack and it would allow, for example, proof of stake chain. So right now the unbonding time either is very long or infinite or multiple weeks. And so what we can do is to reduce this to like less than one day. And so that is sort of what we built. And right now we have a uh, integration with 25 Cosmos chains providing these timestamps. Wow, I think, yeah, that's a very strong proposition to reduce the unbonding. Um, since you mentioned that you integrate with uh, 25 Cosmos chains already, um, what are the, like, like maybe like why, why explain a bit more, like why did you start with Cosmos and what um, are key factors for, for speedy integration? I, I understand that you just launched testnet like a few months ago. And one more thing, like aside from unbonding use case, what are some of the use cases as a protocol use Babylon? Yeah, so um, why Cosmos first? So first of all, our technology is useful for any proof of stake chains. So that's the one thing. Now, of course, there are many proof of chain out there, so we have to start somewhere. So we identified Cosmos as a first starting point for several reasons. One is that Cosmos chains are application specific chains. So application specific chains means that you focus on one particular application and you build a blockchain for that. So you specialize your blockchain, your technology stack for that particular application. So that gives a lot of flexibility, a lot of optimization opportunity, but it also has a security risk because now, because you're specialized in one application, your market cap tends to be relatively low because you're a smaller chain. And so therefore, 
uh, Bitcoin security is particularly important for these smaller chains. So that's one reason why we chose Cosmos as the starting point. However, um, outside Cosmos, now there's a very strong trend in many different ecosystems like Polygon or um, Binance or uh, Avalanche to build these re similar application specific chains. Some of them are called subnets, supernets, uh, medium nets. Sorry, that was just a made up name. But uh, many such uh, application specific chains. So I think all of them would could benefit from Bitcoin security. That's number one. Number two is that we find that uh, Cosmos have this very interesting technology called inter-blockchain communication, IBC. So this is one of the strongest bridging technology across the whole uh, blockchain ecosystem. And we find that this IBC used, was designed for transferring messages, basically token transfers. But actually we can leverage this IBC to do security transfer. So we basically built um, a system in which we can use the IBC to spread the security of Bitcoin across many chains in a very easy way. And that's go back to your question, why our adoption is pretty fast in the Cosmos ecosystem. Because to get the Bitcoin security, each chain, all they need to do is to first open an IBC connection to Babylon. Uh, Babylon itself is a, a IBC enabled chain and that allows us to spread security very easily. So, and IBC is a technology that is now spreading out beyond Cosmos to other ecosystems as well. In fact, there was just a tweet today on IBC enabled rollups actually. Uh, I think it's Eclipse if I remember correctly. Uh, so I think uh, IBC is kind of spreading out and we can leverage off IBC to spread this Bitcoin security as well. Got it. So is, is there any other use case that you want to highlight uh, aside from just um, aside from bond and bonding and then uh, for small chains to kickstart and, and, and add the security on top? Yeah. So, you know, the thing is that um, for these small chains right now, security is very expensive, particularly to bootstrap because they have to in, have a very high inflation rate. Like in Cosmos chains, the typical inflation rate is 20%. So that's extremely costly. And what Bitcoin security can do for these chains, uh, we have discussed a lot with the founders of these chain, is that now they can offload at least a good chunk of the security budget to Bitcoin. And that will allow them to reduce the cost of security. So instead of paying 20%, maybe they can pay lower, like 10%. For example, Ethereum only pays 5%, I think a roughly 5% yield. And that is because it is a very large source of security. For these chains, they're trying to compete for capital. So it's very expensive for them. So by having Bitcoin security, that could reduce the um, inflation quite a bit. And they could use that instead of securing, they can use it for the application, for incentivizing people to use the application. After all, actually, the goal of this blockchain is not to secure themselves. That's not the goal. That's a means, right? You secure a chain because you want to uh, solve a, a particular application. Mm -hmm. And so I think in some sense, I think uh, going back to Shriram's point, this is in some sense the heart of shared security is that you really don't want blockchains or applications to spend a lot of resource to secure themselves because you want them to focus on building the application mm. as fast as you can. So if you have a token, you want to use it to incentivize application rather than use the, the capital to secure yourself. So I think that's sort of very consistent with what Shriram was mentioning. Yeah. Now let's switch to Agalayer, Shriram. Um, you recently announced the mainnet launch. Um, can you share with us more about the, the launch timeline and what type of protocols or applications that you would like to attract to develop on Agon layer. And second part will be about the validator side. Like what would be some of the benefits you want to highlight for early risk takers that want to participate? Yeah. Um, so one way to think about uh, Eigenlayer is 
If you look at Ethereum and you wanted to build an application, right now your programmability is you have to go and write a smart contract in Ethereum. Right? That is the programmability. What the layer two rollups did is they said, the idea is now anybody can build any execution environment, like instead of Ethereum virtual machine, you can have a web assembly or some other language, but as long as you can prove that you're, you did your execution correctly to Ethereum on a EVM contract, you can write these applications. There is a whole host of applications for which we cannot simply um, rely on this pattern. And uh, I'll give several examples. For example, in rollups on Ethereum, one of the main bottleneck is they all need to write data to Ethereum. Why? Because they're offloading the computation so when you're offloading computation, you need to publish either the input or the output of the computation, which is some amount of data onto Ethereum so that anybody can, it is transparent to anybody who wants to check that the computation has been done correctly. And for also somebody else to pick up the computation and go ahead and do the next step of the computation. So to make rollups trustless, it requires the data to be published on Ethereum. But Ethereum's data bandwidth is very small. It is 83 kilobytes per second. So the total amount of volume of data that you can write on Ethereum is 83 kilobytes per second. And we think the set of applications that need uh, shared security is much, much higher than uh, what Ethereum can support. So the first application we are building on top of EigenLayer is a data availability layer. This is kind of like a layer where you publish data for anybody to, that the data is available for anybody to download and access. It's called a data availability layer. We basically take some of the core ideas in the Ethereum roadmap called dunk sharding, and we take that and build our own uh, implementation, which has a lot of uh, cryptographic similarities, but architectural differences, how the distributed system works, how the peer-to-peer -peer network works, who, who sends data to whom and all these kind of things. We optimize heavily all those things and we can get this system to run at 10 megabytes per second rather than uh, the original, uh, the Ethereum's data rate today of 83 kilobytes per second. And we think there's actually like a potential to increase this from 10 megabytes per second to even a thousand X in a four to five year period. So this can provide enough data bandwidth for many, many different services to, to build on top. This is one example of what can be built on top of EigenLayer, which is EigenDA. This system is called Eigen Data Availability, which is EigenDA. And EigenDA is the first service we're building ourselves to show both the power of this platform, but also to bootstrap this platform because you need services to bootstrap this platform. But beyond EigenDA, we have a whole bunch of other problems that rollups are facing. What are the problems? Rollups need sequencing services. They need some group of nodes to order transactions and then make statements that this is the ordered set of transactions. If we could have a service, so that requires decentralization. So many people are confused why a rollup has its own decentralized committee, but also then borrows some aspect of security from Ethereum. Why not borrow everything from Ethereum? And there are many technical reasons for this. So having a decentralized sequencing layer on top of EigenLayer, like you use the same Ethereum validators, but you would now go and run this ordering service on top of it. That's something that could be very interesting on EigenLayer. We see already teams uh, building on it publicly, uh, a team called Espresso, uh, which is also some of the professors, for, former um, formerly affiliated Stanford, Ben Fish and others are building, which is building on EigenLayer. So that's one example of a category, decentralized sequencing. And then if you look at some of the other problems in the modular Ethereum landscape, you see that rollups have very high settlement time. Ethereum's finality time is 12, 12 minutes. Blocks get produced every 12 seconds, but finalized only every 12 minutes. And a lot of the rollup actions are contingent on finality. So what this does is in comparison to other systems, you know, new layer ones like SUI and Aptos and, and so on, where you can have like one second finality times, this is very slow. Can we have rollups to have super fast settlement guarantees where somebody builds a super fast consensus protocol? You know, David and I have like both together and separately written like tens of papers on consensus protocols. And there are many other great ideas out there. 
many people wa would want to build these consensus protocols to optimize for latency, to optimize for many of these properties so that rollups can now avail the full Ethereum security, but get super fast finality. Maybe you have a one second rollup finality with $35 billion economic security. So that, that's another category of examples that fit the rollup ecosystem. Rollups have a lag to finality. They take, for example, optimistic rollup takes seven days. Even ZK rollups don't write uh, data to Ethereum often because the proof's very expensive. So in between this time, how can you exchange data and information across rollups? Can we have super fast bridges across rollups relying on restaked security or some other category? We have one of the biggest problems in the Ethereum ecosystem is MEV management. What is MEV management? MEV is maximal extractable value, which basically arises because of the degree of freedom that block proposers have in creating uh, blocks in how they order transactions. They are free to do whatever they want. What uh, block proposers can do on eigenlayer is they can come in and say, I'm following a specific ordering rule. For example, when David sends me a transaction, I encrypt a transaction, I send a receipt saying that I'm gonna decrypt, after you send me the decryption key, I'm gonna include the decrypted transaction. If I don't do this, I may get my ETH slash on eigenlayer. So, Essentially, what Eigenlayer does is provide an adapter layer so that any missing service in the Ethereum ecosystem can then be built on top. So this is, so I explained all of these examples which are adjacent to the core Ethereum ecosystem. But there's also a whole bunch of other things. For example, one of the cool services we are seeing, uh, just to highlight two categories. One is decentralization oracles. So one of the problems with blockchains is the value decentralization, but there is no way for the protocol itself to give more APR or more rewards to the more decentralized nodes because the protocol doesn't know who is more decentralized. If we can have a protocol which itself measures how decentralized other nodes are by sending network layer pings across these different uh, nodes, you can actually have a measurement of how decentralized nodes are so that services building on top of eigenlayer for example can say that i want to only recruit more decentralized nodes or like david was saying you know may offer a diversity penalty like you know david was talking earlier about diversity but geographic diversity is a key component of like diversity in blockchains you may say that uh, you know i only want nodes which you know why i only want five percent of nodes to be in any one country in the world you know, if there's more of them, then they have the staking rewards. So there's all kinds of really interesting things one can build on top of a decentralization oracle. And finally, you know, AI is a big major topic. One of the really interesting things in AI is how do you have, you know, you go to chat GPT today and then you want to have like AI inference. AI inference is highly centralized because, you know, open AI servers are seeing all our data when they serve us these queries. Can we have a decentralized open network, which is, you know, already exists in the Ethereum valid, valid economy? Can many of them serve like AI queries? So we have a couple of projects building on, on AI type of services on Eigenlayer. So these are examples of what we think uh, are missing in the ecosystem. And we've actually gone out and proactively uh, uh, seeded some of these ideas. So um, then would it be fair to say that we should expect, because you mentioned a lot in the, in the roll-up, um, would, would, would it be fair to say that we should expect to see the first application on Eigenlayer around roll-up? And then maybe, yeah, okay. Um, then I think my um, second question is about validator. Um, what are some of the key benefits that you want to highlight for, for early restakers that want to participate? Yeah, for yeah. early early restakers, basically, uh, the, why would somebody restake? They're restaking because each of these services offer some incentives to restake. So the way Eigenlayer works is, you know, you set your withdrawal credentials or whatever, like you convey the information to the Eigenlayer contract, setting the permissions that, you know, you're participating in Eigenlayer. But really, you start participating in Eigenlayer only when you restake to a particular service. So the the fundamental fee model on Eigenlayer is the fees coming from the services 
you know, the oracles or data availability or decentralized sequencer or AI services, they'll be paying a portion of the fees that they receive to the uh, Ethereum restakers through Eigenlayer. Some of these services may have their own token, either existing or new tokens, and they may pay a portion of that token inflation to actually, you know, seed this system. Like David mentioned in the Cosmos ecosystem, you know, people are used to paying like 20%. But because now you have a shared security substrate, you don't have to pay 20%. Maybe you pay 2% because maybe there are 10 servers that all share a common pool of security. So these are the kinds of um, uh, incentives that are there for restakers. One particular incentive to restake even when uh, immediately, even when there is no services is that, you know, in the Ethereum protocol setting so one way to participate in eigenlayer is called native restaking, where you set your withdrawal credentials. When you uh, stake in Ethereum, you have the withdrawal powers. Normally, you would set it to your own hardware wallet, for example. The way eigenlayer works is you add one step in the withdrawal flow, where the withdrawal goes from Ethereum to the eigenlayer contracts and then back to your wallet. And what this does is that the... the um, when, when you're setting the withdrawal credentials, you are actually setting the uh, ability for eigenlayer to potentially uh, slash you. But setting the withdrawal credentials is, uh, uh, you can only do it when you're actually staking. So as more stake enters now, and they want to participate later in eigenlayer, they may not have an opportunity to exit their position and then enter back into Ethereum staking. So it, it provides an opportunity for people to participate early. And finally, services may not want to allow everybody to restake. So restaking in Eigenlayer is double opt-in. Double opt-in means both the staker would want to do something with the service, the service wants to do something with the staker. So it's a two-way two you know, match. So because it's a double opt-in, what happens is some of the services may say, I only want to allow a certain limited amount of restaking. I only want $10 million of security. So whatever is the first, you know, 10 million who is restaking, I'm going to allow it. And people are going to naturally prioritize the earlier stakers who have had a longer track record inside the system. Mm, got it. So I think now we kind of get a sense of uh, use cases and benefits to, to stakeholders of, of um, Eggalayer. Um, I would like to move on to discuss more about key challenges. So um, what uh, can you share with us, like the key challenges of your face in launching um, Babylon and Aegean layer? Maybe start from, from David. Yeah, so um, in our case, so in Sri Lanka's case, he is working in the Ethereum ecosystem. In our case, the biggest challenge is in some sense, we are crossing multiple ecosystems because Bitcoin is one ecosystem and the proof of stake world is another, and in fact, multiple ecosystems. So our shared security project is, I think one of the biggest challenge is really a education challenge, which is to explain to different communities why Bitcoin security is of high value. Uh, fortunate for us, though, is that what we found out is that Cosmos, for example, uh, as a starting point, many of the founders are in some sense uh, unhidden Bitcoin maxis. So they actually love Bitcoin. But because, as, as Shira mentioned, Bitcoin has limited um, programmability, they decide to build applications using proof of stake networks like Cosmos. So I think the fact that Bitcoin is a such a strong brand name that is the oldest, the OG of the blockchain, I think really helps us a lot in terms of um, convincing people that Bitcoin security is really a good thing to have. Got it. So three round, I think, um, would like to hear your comments on the challenge as well, like especially the, the concerns recently that Vitalik uh, recently expressed concerns about restaking to secure the chain. <laughs> what would be your comments on that? Yeah, I think Vitalik's making a very particular point. 
which is uh, you know the uh, for those of you who may not have seen it there's a blog post called do not overburden ethereum consensus that vitalik wrote like a few days back i think uh, the title was somewhat misleading uh, actually what the article is saying is do not overload ethereum social consensus so all of these chains uh, you know have algorithmic consensus which is nodes run and basically uh, you know arrive at consensus but once in a while when the algorithmic consensus fails there is a necessity to intervene using social consensus if there are two forks in a blockchain we need to decide which fork is correct for example so i think the article is basically saying that many categories of applications building on top of ethereum should should not make the assumption that hey i'm going to go like do something wrong in my application and you know it's going to blow up and now that the application blew up you now go and ask ethereum to fork to say that to save you know whatever value was lost in the application or whatever and i think that is all that he's basically saying is do not assume that you know ethereum is going to fork for any particular application or layer 2 or restaking or anything and i think it's a perfectly valid comment and in fact we've kind of completely designed our platform under this assumption that like any other smart contract any other roll up any other system we cannot assume that like if something bad happens on eigen layer or any other layer ethereum has to go and fork it for that in fact if you see in the article there is a uh, he's actually provided a very nuanced analysis of what are low risk use cases of you know restaking and what are higher risk use cases of restaking and the principle is very simple do not require social uh subjectivity in your system so if as long as you're slashing for purely objective actions which is how i can live works is actually pretty simple it's like any other smart contract that can be written on ethereum so i think you know the title was somewhat misleading people uh, didn't fully understand exactly what he was saying because it said don't overburden ethereum consensus but it's really just or don't overburden ethereum social consensus mm-hmm. and, and all our use cases that i pointed out are all have attributable objective slashing so that's how we build our systems Mm, got it. Yeah, just to add to that point a little bit, because you know, your ther- uh, Vitalik's post did cause quite a lot of attention. But I think uh, I, I do agree with what Shriram interpretation of that post is. However, I think uh, given the reaction, I think it's also fair to say that uh, shared security is relatively a new, a new area, and I believe there is also uh, um, the burden. no overburden but the burden on us shuram and me and other share security projects to educate the public about sort of the risk and rewards of share security uh, and uh, i think shuram and i has been talking a lot also on try to form some alliance uh, going forward to sort of establish a set of best practices for share security and i think vitalik post is sort of saying hey you know uh i think it's good to establish some best practices share security is a good thing but you know you don't want to over abuse it and uh, the question is what are the best practices that uh, avoid people from over abusing it i think that broad point is how i interpret from vitalix post mm yeah i think it's a, the new concept and then yeah definitely need to by a common ground or standards of, of what the chat security. I think we have to wrap up maybe this. Um, so I think looking ahead, like chat security will continue to evolve. Like maybe just like, um, what are some of the key areas or technologies that you hope to see more? And that would be the, the last question. Yeah. Can can start with David? Like what not, areas? Okay. What, yeah. Yeah, so um, we've been working really hard on sharing Bitcoin security. So just to give you an example of a project we're working on right now. So Shura mentioned that um, uh, Bitcoin has a vast security pool, but the problem with Bitcoin is it doesn't have a smart contract layer. So, for example, Shura's eigenlayer project really exploits the smart contract layer. to do restaking. 
Hey, so we asked the question, hey, you can restake Ethereum. Can you stake Bitcoin, the asset? And well, then we hit a wall because well, there's no smart contract. So drop an alpha is that um, we figure out a solution to solve this problem. So this is what we are actually working on right now. Wow, that's interesting. How about you, Shiram? Any final thoughts? No, that's really amazing. I, I think, you know, uh, once Bitcoin becomes programmable, I think it's going to be really, really insane. Uh, one particular thing that I think uh, recently Justin Drake wrote an article uh, uh, explaining or elucidating some of the attacks on Bitcoin itself, you know, the economic attacks, basically buy up enough mining equipment and stuff. And proof of work is a interesting security model. And over time, the security budget of Bitcoin is decaying. So ideas like what uh, David just mentioned, which is if you can kind of use Bitcoin for staking, that'd be something really amazing. Um, from my perspective, I think I just want to end with one uh, one thing, which has nothing really to do with Eigenlayer, but uh, the broader space. I think um, we're all building blockchains here and blockchains are actually one of the hardest security models to build on. And th the reason is, you know, it is an open source system, which means if you're an attacker, I can read the source of what is going on. So I can find weaknesses, right? It's an open state system, which means the, the particular, the attacker can wait for an opportune moment in which, you know, they can come and attack. It is an open entry system because you have censorship resistance in the system. Any attacker can come in. It is an open exit system because once you attack and get some money, now you uh, transactions are irreversible. So you have it. So it's actually like a pretty insane security model. And actually, just like we want best practices for shared security, I think we also need best practices for security itself. And I think, you know, we are seeing this at the edges in bridge, ha bridge hacks and other things, but Actually, it is at the center of this field, and we need to really find a solution to this. So I'll I'll stop with that. I'm looking forward to new ideas that will come in and solve that problem. No, well, yeah, thank you so much, Hiram and David. Um, very insightful session, and I hope to see more evolution and or ideas in the chess uh, security space. Thank you. Thank you very much.